Um, with that said, um, those were some amazing points that both Carl, Patrick, and Harry uh, brought up. So what I'd like to do is just ask everybody to turn their video on and, um, and we'll have uh, Patrick do a quick panel on uh, or just moderate a quick uh, Q&A session uh, with uh, Ari and Carl. So I'll, I'll let Patrick take it from here and we have a uh, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, we did get a lot of questions on the chat, so we'll be relaying them here directly. And then uh, I'm sure Patrick also has a handful of questions himself. So I'll let him take it from here. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Karthik. Um, So this is the first question that I basically got from the, the chat. Um, so the question was more to do with the EVM, how in, so the EVM in layer one, how interoperable will it be with the EVM on layer two? And this also sort of leads to my next question that's around this, because you both mentioned that your rollups are good for experimenting. So how easy is it to change, to introduce a new EVM chains on your, on your rollup? Let's say we wanted to experiment with EIP 3074. Could that be implemented on your rollup before it hits main chain Ethereum? So um, I'll let one of you guys go first. Maybe maybe Carl, I guess, because he looks really excited uh, for his energy. <laughs> that, I, that, that may always be the case, though. Um, yes, definitely. You can 100% experiment with various uh, EIP changes. Um, and there, there are there are specifically certain things that are easier, easier to experiment than others. Um, but uh, for the most part, yeah. Yeah, what about, what about you, Harry? Uh... Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I, I could basically second what Carl said. I mean, that's like one of the, one of the like cooler things about rollups is basically kind of like how much it, it opens up the design space. Now, you know, the, the caveat to that is like, once there's like launched rollup chains that have a lot of money and users, we're probably not gonna wanna get like too crazy um, and we're going to want to like run test nets and kind of innovate, you know, reasonably slowly over time, but essentially kind of, you know, spinning what up kind of your own roll up chain, essentially that isn't kind of part of the main one and doesn't like synchronously communicate with the main one, but like is sort of your test bed environment is like, you know, something that's like really awesome. So I would, for instance, like really expect over like a couple of years from now, when a new kind of piece of, when a new, you know, EIP is proposed, there'll be like a roll-up chain that's launched on mainnet, you know, with the full economics that's kind of running with that, with that EIP in, in, added in. So that kind of, rather than just having like a separate test net, we can get like a much more kind of authentic um, test of, uh, of the new tech. Awesome. awesome. So that also leads to my, my next question on the EVM. So how vanilla will your EVM be when you launch your initial roll-up? Are you going to have any like custom features in your EVM or is it going to be uh, complete vanilla upon launch? You know, so are you going to experiment right away? Um, yeah, uh, I, I oh, you go ahead. Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, we're going to, ours is going to be kind of mostly vanilla, um, but with a few exceptions. Um, kind of the two biggest ones that come to mind um, is with kind of supporting alternate transaction formats. And so the biggest one there is, is with support for BLS, um, which is kind of uh, awesome, awesome efficient signatures that are going to be able to cut down the, uh, the call data usage of rollups even more. Um, another area where, uh, where kind of Arbitrum, we've done a, a fair amount of work um, is on the kind of gas pricing and economics. Uh, it turns out that kind of for a rollup chain, there's a kind of a, a fairly kind of different set of concerns compared to Ethereum's L1 um, in sort of how the economics of the chain work. Um, and so we've kind of done a lot of work there, like very, like very inspired by EIP 1559 um, and kind of trying to achieve sort of the, the UX improvements uh, that are kind of given, that are given by that EIP. So, uh, so yeah, like kind of around the edges, basically sort of trying to innovate, but like with the core model, essentially as similar as possible so that we're not like, well, the thing we don't want to do is confuse people too much um, or cause things that would work on Ethereum to break. Um, and so the kind of, those are the areas we're staying away from and the areas kind of that don't have those risks are the areas we're trying to push the envelope a little bit. So I can also second a bunch of that. However, one thing I will get into specifically is like, what it really means, like what have we done with the EVM, right? We are literally running an EVM in Geth. 
And what we're doing is we're actually intercepting the calls to a smart contract in that EVM and then hooking that, like kind of creating a pre-compile for that contract and hooking into the GETS internal storage. So when you say like, are you making modifications to the EVM? Like the only modifications that we are making to the EVM are actually how the smart contracts are structured, but we're using the EVM, vanilla EVM software to support those features. So it's, it's this very interesting, like, you know, we are as tightly integrated and kind of along for the ride in that sense as, you know, I can imagine. You actually just reminded me, uh, I mean, Optimism definitely are dealing with the EVM because you, I think at one point crashed Go Ethereum is also impacted in Fura. <laughs> oh, yeah. And by the way, the reason why we did that, I mean, the reason why we did that, I mean, the reason why we found that vulnerability was because we are working with the EVM at such a low and insane level that we are using precompiles that just don't make sense in normal context. There is the identity precompile where you call it and it just returns what you called. And no one uses that, like that's some crazy stuff, but we had to use it for part of our software. And it's like, oh, of course there's a bug in that precompile. By the way, if you wanna find a hard for vulnerability, look at the precompiles. <laughs> Exciting. So um, I'm going to move on to the next question then. Um, this is also from the, the chat. So one thing I mentioned in my, in my talk was like, you know, withdrawal integrity. How do we guarantee someone can withdraw their funds, you know, if the sequencer disappears? And their question was, what's that interaction like going from an L2 tra transaction to the L1 transaction? So do you guys just want to give us an overview of what it's like on your systems? Sure. Um, so an L2 transaction is, you know, you're sending directly to the sequencer, but an L1 transaction is essentially an L1 to L2 message. And now notably that L1 to L2 message can be anything. It can be, for instance, a fully signed valid L2 transaction. And so everyone on L2 has a kind of smart wallet. It is implemented as a contract wallet, which actually, you know, you can then upgrade to, you know, whatever you really want. But the, the kind of general sense is you would essentially be sending a meta transaction-esque thing, which is a message into L2 that is eventually, you know, run in the L2 system, of course, with higher latency. Mm -hmm. Harry, do you want to give us an overview as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for, for, our, for Arbitrum, the story is relatively similar. There's some differences there um, in that, like, our, our kind of L2 accounts are, are, are kind of relatively, are basic EOAs. So basic kind of like, we don't, we don't have like kind of smart contract wallets by default. We just have sort of regular regular accounts. And so for kind of in our system, basically that L2, to, that L1 to L2 tra transaction um, just basically sort of puts a, submits a regular transaction um, from that user. Um, but, you know, these are, these are kind of like technical details. So I think sort of in practice, that'll end up being, feeling pretty much the same. Awesome. Well, also what I want to ask is, you know, we're at a hackathon full of newbies. You're really excited to get involved with this. Can you give like a one minute overview of what it's like to get started on your on your on your layer two system? What would the dev developer experience be like? Um, when anyone can go, uh, maybe Carl, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, so the developer experience, we are trying to keep it as minimal as possible. So the uh, we have a tutorial that you can uh, check out on our GitHub like optimism tutorial. And essentially you take a, for instance, a hard hat project and you add a couple lines in and then you run your tests and it, you know, it should, it all, it all passes. And so that is very similar. You, the general, the, the general format is you, you know, uh, add the optimistic Ethereum network to your MetaMask, and then you can start interacting with it and sending transactions, deploying contracts, whatever, you know, whatever you may, whatever you want. So it's just essentially just think of it as a change to your provider. Um, there are a few oddities around fee payment. You know, there's, there's some caveats here and there, but um, that's at least where we are headed. Um, yeah, for us, basically, um, and I think I showed on one of my slides, there's a, there's a kind of a little landing page, testnet.arbitrum.io. Um, really all, all it is, is kind of, if you, you have a, a truffle project, a hard hat project, um, where you have kind of, where you fill in your provider, there's an Arbitrum network, um, there's a URL, there's a chain ID, 
Um, it's, it's a public test net. And so you can just kind of take your existing project, no need to do anything um, and deploy it. There are a couple of corner cases and a couple of edges you could hit. Um, and we have kind of, you know, a little more, there's a little more detail in there. But if you, if you try that out, chances are pretty good that it'll just work. Um, so. Awesome. So the next question is also from the chat. And I guess there's two variants of this. The one in the chat was, you know, why do we have to use Ethereum for data availability? Can we use like, I know, IPSS, Filecoin, et cetera? So what do you guys think about that? Does it, are we Ethereum maxis here? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you, I, oh, sorry. Oh no, go for it, go for it. You go, you go, Carl, you go, yeah. Oh. Uh, okay, no, no Ethereum maxis here. We got to be we're blockchain maxis. Uh, but anyway, uh, the <laughs> the thing that I was talking about in the pre in my presentation was availability is like the pipes, right? It's not the storage. So IPFS just doesn't really do the same thing as data availability that we're coming to consensus on. The reason why availability on Ethereum is really nice is because it's really confusing for developers to have tons of different security models for your different information. Right. If I'm using the trusted Internet, it's just easier for my brain if it's all trusted at the same level or a similar level. There will be gradients. I'm not saying there won't be. But generally speaking, for mo many applications of wide variety, it's just going to be nice to have a homogeneous trust, trust model. Awesome. Well, what about yourself, Harry? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting how this will, uh, will expand over time. Like, I think, you know, if, like, well, Ethereum is the place to be right now, and it's the place to be hopefully forever. Um, I think there are, there is some kind of interesting work going on here. I mean, state channels, for instance, have their own solution to data availability, which is just the people involved agree that it's available. Um, there, there's also kind of, there's all sorts of, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there'll be some discussion, I think a little later today about the, the cool stuff that, uh, that some of the ZK rollups teams are doing. There's like some terms bouncing around ZK Porter, Volition. Um, there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff here. So kind of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ongoing work. Like I totally agree with Carl that like, I think that like, you know, simplicity here is king um, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, but there is kind of there is a, there are a lot of really cool kind of research directions here that do the same thing as rollups, which are kind of like modify the security model of Ethereum a little, but like probably within enough constraints that like the systems are still sort of reasonable to use. Um, so yeah, we, you know we'll we'll see where that we are in five years. Um. Awesome. So I, I'm going to ask two more questions. One's again to do with the day availability. So as we know, and you've both alluded to this in your presentation. The real bottleneck to these uh, rollups is Ethereum's bandwidth, you know, call data, how much data can you send, et cetera. And so that's going to be the main gas consumption for the layer one. Uh, so I'd actually like, I, mean, I don't know if you have any numbers handy, you may not have numbers handy, but do you have any like example applications that use your service and you're like, oh, they were using 5 million gas in Ethereum, but now they're using X gas in the rollup. You know, like how good was that improvement? And if you don't have numbers, it's fine. It's just, uh, this is interesting. <laughs> uh, um, do you want to go first, Harry, I guess? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think, you know, we, we've had a bunch of different applications deploy on our test that normally the way we figure this is we just sort of compare the, we have our, our block explorer just kind of displays the L1 costs associated with the transactions and we compare it to what it would have been or what it was if they're also already launched on layer one. So I think we've seen kind of anywhere between like a, I think in, in, in the worst case, a like, 10 or 20 X in the best case, 500 X improvement. Um, I think kind of like our, our go-to like a, a, a while ago, I think kind of one of the, basically the first, uh, the first thing we did uh, on, on kind of the Arbitrum test net ourselves when we got it working just because it's like so core to Ethereum was we, uh, we, we tried out launching Uniswap V2. And I think the, and, and if I remember correctly, the transactions there were coming in at, uh, at around um, 1900 gas uh, per, uh, per transaction. Um, assuming kind of the batches of transactions were of a, of a sufficient size, um, okay, which kind so. of there, there's this interesting thing, which is like there's a fixed cost for the batch, and then there's the variable cost for transaction. Uh, but one of the really cool things that optimistic rollups have um, is the batches don't need to be that big. And so for Arbitrum, I think it's kind of like fifty thousand gas um, fixed cost, and then we divide that over all the transactions in the batch. So you can kind of still be very cheap even with not very many transactions. Cool. Uh, go ahead, Carl. 
Very similar, but the uh, uh, maybe one thing I'll shout out is Synthetics in particular has uh, a bunch of transactions that are like 2 million gas on L1. And, mm. you know, we reduce that less than, you know, like 5,000 gas on L2. Of course, you know, caveats, batch sizes, et cetera. So like that is some applications are going to be crazy gas savings. Now, just one extra note is that the more we can, the more like uh, uh, people use the system, the more our compression techniques and like the more mature we get, we can actually offload more of that availability off chain and we can improve those uh, uh, performance characteristics even more. So it's pretty cool. Awesome, exciting. So I hope all the all the devs out there realize that you're going to get like 100x savings if you use uh, optimistic rollups. So my final question is, it's a very quick one. You know, as I think Carl alluded this in his presentation, we're one big community, we're all BFFs. You know, you're building competing products, but you know what, you're all like, you know, good, good, good community. So my question is, um, what's your favorite thing about the other project? You know, what gets you excited for it? That's a nice way to end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. Um, who gets to go first? Whoever wants to go first, I'll give you a second to think about it if you want. <laughs> I mean, so I, I, have, I, have a, I have a joke answer and a real answer. My, my okay. joke answer is you guys have the best memes. Like seriously, like your meme game is like I mean, so clutch. Like, you, know, <laughs> you know, I, I got I to give it to you there. Um, <laughs> no, no. And, and you know, and, and, and the more serious answer is like, you know, the way the way that kind of be able to like you know use use get um is is really cool um and like kind of reuse reuse those existing components is is you know super super cool i will my answer is since I learned about Arbitrum, okay, the first thing was I was like, okay, Ben, tell me how Arbitrum works. It is like, I do not know, but it sounds crazy cool. Like what is, how do you have a virtual machine that uh, like traverses a tree? Literally it traverses a tree. That is legitimately like the coolest mind expanding thing. And y'all are always at the kind of forefront of just, you know, mind expanding uh, uh, kind of designs and design spaces. So it has been really inspiring to like understand all of the trade-off spaces or all of the kind of trade-offs that y'all have made. And also the, I mean, man, I just can't get over the fact that y'all's VM just like goes up a tree and like Trevert goes down. And it's like, I, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I oh. feel like one of the kind of beautiful things has been like that, like both projects are just making each other better. Like I know that like, you know, for instance, like kind of the, the EVM compatibility a year ago, we didn't, we hadn't focused anywhere near as much. And like kind of the like seeing kind of where, you know, seeing, you know, with like the work you were doing. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways inspired us um, in terms of like pushing for that sort of like, let's make, let's make this look and feel as much like Ethereum as possible, which is like clearly, you know, in, in, in hindsight, the, the right thing to do. And it seems like kind of, you know, one of the, one of the awesome things about optimistic rollups in general. Awesome. So I'm, I'm going to finish there, guys, just for the, the time. So uh, I'll hand it back to Karnik. Thank you very much for answering our questions. Harry, Carl, thank you so much for that. And uh, Patrick, thanks so much for asking that uh, question and ending on a really positive and wonderful note. So thanks again. And now uh, we 